Hey, this is Phil Diaz. I'm the pastor at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. It's my prayer that God would use this podcast to speak to your life right where you're at. I pray it also builds your faith and helps give you perspective on how God can work, move, and transform your life. Enjoy the message. Well, it is so good to be with all of you here today. It is so good to be here at Greencastle Church of the Nazarene. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, good morning, neighbor. Amen, amen. So today we are continuing in our sermon series that is called God With Us. And last week we talked about how God was with us in the valley. All right, how many of you remember that? God was with us in the valley. Today we're going to a different place. God with us in the wilderness. Turn to your neighbor and say, the wilderness. The wilderness. Amen. Let's stand up for the reading of the word today. We're going to be looking again at our main Advent scripture. This is Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. And this is what the word of the Lord says. It says, look! Exclamation point. Look! The virgin will conceive a child. And she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means, say it with me, church, God is with us. Amen. Let's bow our heads today for the receiving of this word. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this promise that is found in Scripture. The promise that God is with us. Lord, we desperately in these days need this promise. Father, I feel for so many that have so many burdens and so many struggles here this morning. And so, Father, I've been asking that you help open up this word, open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our spirits, open up ourselves to having more of you and less of the jacked up selves that we can be at times. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be able to just be present within your presence here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You guys may be seated here this morning. Now, the question I have to ask myself every time I, I read this scripture is this. This is the question is, why in the world would God want to be with me? Or I'll reframe the question, why would God want to be with you? It's an interesting question. Now, if I was going to take a polling, perhaps these might be some answers. Someone would, may say, well, because I've always followed his commandments perfectly. And that's being self-righteous. <laughs> Maybe you might say, I'm a lot more knowledgeable about the Bible than probably 99.9% .9 of everyone in here. And that's called being prideful. You may say, God recognizes my superior talents, my abilities, and my suave character. Is that any of you this morning? If so, you need to pray because that's being boastful. Maybe it's in your life you've said, well, I've just never made any mistakes. Of course he would want to be with me. You might need to look again because, again, you're being a little bit more self-righteous. You may say, well, I'm from a special lineage of family, and God favors my heritage. Well, that's just being arrogant. <laughs> and... Maybe you might say, I just deserve God's presence because of all the good things I've done. You don't know how many good things I've done, but I've done so many more good things. And that's just being self-entitled. So, let's get to the point of really why God wants to be with us. It has nothing to do with any of those things. It has nothing to do with your performance. It has nothing to do with anything that you can actually do. Did you know that the God that we love and that we serve and that we worship every single day, not just on Sundays, prefers to be with you because he made you. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> he not just made you, he loves you, he cares for you, and he gave you the best gift that he could ever give, and that is himself. That is why God wants to be with you. And so part of all of that is I have seven big reasons, I think, of why God would want to be with you. So if you're a note taker, get this down. <laughs> Number one reason is because of love and relationship. God desires to have an intimate relationship with you. Yes, you, yes, you that may be coming into church 
and you're jacked up on something, he wants to love you. You who might be just so religious, but you don't even see, he wants to love you. Love and relationship. This is why he sent Jesus. Number two is for guidance and direction. God provides wisdom and God provides us with a moral compass, with a framework that we can have within our lives, set within his word. Number three, God wants to be in relationship with you because he wants to give you comfort and support. He offers solace in times of need. He gives us salvation and redemption. God wants to be with you because he wants to reconcile your life to his so you can be more like his son, Jesus. Amen. Number five, he wants to be with you because of transformation and sanctification. A lot of ish words in there, but I'm telling you, transformation and sanctification have a big role and that God wants to be with you. Why? Because he wants to mold you into something better. He wants to take you in the way that you are, in the shape that you are, and he wants to be able to mold you into the image of Jesus. Number six, he wants to have a relationship with you because of fulfillment of his promises. God keeps his faithful promises. And this is just one small part of that. And last but not least, number seven, he wants to have community and fellowship with you. He wants to foster unity among believers. Do you believe that, church? Amen. And so, oftentimes, as we talked about in the kids' story even, life can take us into some crazy places. And you might be thinking, man, the pastor is really going crazy today. We're going to a crazy place. But it is kind of a crazy place that we're going to. Because, see, we're talking about the wilderness today. I want to talk about the wilderness because life sometimes takes us in the wilderness. The Bible talks about the wilderness in several ways. The wilderness in life can be looked at as a place of testing and temptation. Wilderness tests faith and strengthens our holiness. Did you know that? It tests our faith and it strengthens us in living a holy life. It gives us preparation for God's calling on our lives. It equips us for specific purposes and growth within the desolate times. Being in the wilderness can help give us a spiritual growth and dependence on God that we can never find in the mountaintop. We talked about that last week. And lastly, it gives us restoration and renewal. A season of spiritual renewal of God's refreshment. Let me, let me just ask you, in this season where you're at right now, okay, and I know the situations many of you are facing. But in this season right now, do you not need God's refreshment in your life? Amen? Do you not need God's refreshment? So this sermon, it's not just for one group or this group. It's for everyone here, okay? It's for me, it's for you, it's for everyone here. Because oftentimes, we can go to a place that we either lead ourselves to, or even the devil may lead us into, where it can be really lonely. And maybe that's your wilderness. Maybe you're just dry on the inside. You're spiritually dry, mentally dry, emotionally. Whatever the case may be, you may be looking for a way out of that in a wilderness. You may be sad. You may be depressed. And you may be lost in that. And God's wanting to help you with that wilderness. Maybe you're fighting addiction and you're fighting all kinds of demons on the inside because you just feel like you just can't can't, can't stop. God wants to help begin to lead you out of all of that into a better place this morning. Do we still believe in a wonder-working, powerful God, church? Yes. Amen. And so because he is so wonderful and he wants to work within our lives, I want us to be able to see how God can begin to work within the wilderness. The Christmas season is one of the most saddest and loneliest seasons for so many people. And they get lost in so many things. And they can't find their way out. And that is why I want to take us into the wilderness today. To show us how the peace of God can work within the wilderness. We're going to be looking at another piece of scripture here today. We're going to look at our first point. God is working in the wilderness. Turn to your neighbor and say, God works in the wilderness. Now say it like you actually mean it and not, not something boring. Say it like you mean it. God works in the wilderness. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, 
We're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're going to look at some verses here in the Old Testament to help give us some clarification and context for where we're going. So I want to read to you 1 Kings 19. We're going to look at verses 1 through 9 and then a few other verses here in just a moment. It says this, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Verse 3. Elijah heard the news. And Elijah was afraid. And he ran for his life, Lord Jesus. He ran for his life. And when he came to Bathsheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. And he said this, I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the bush and he fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some heavenly baked gluten-free bread. <laughs> baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he lay down again. And then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and he touched him and he said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. And so he got up and he ate and he drank and he was strengthened by that food. And he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Then he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. He said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Hmm. This is an interesting story for us to look into, but I believe it's going to have some profound and wonderful things to teach us here today. First of all, I want to begin with this. We look at this passage. Who in the world is Elijah? Who is Elijah? Who was this guy? Let me tell you. Elijah was a prominent prophet in the Old Testament. He was known for his boldness and his unwavering commitment to God. He had performed remarkable feats, including confronting the prophets of Baal. And let me tell you, there are some tough folks. The prophets of Baal on the Mount of Carmel. And then Elijah was acting as God's prophet and he declared this. He declared that there would be a drought as a consequence to the people's idolatry and wickedness. You know, he was one of those guys in the church. He didn't care. He stood up for what he believed. Amen. And then he said this. He challenged the prophets of Baal and they were numerous and influential in Israel. And he, he did this crazy thing. He challenged him to a crazy contest. And the challenge was pretty straightforward. Both sides would prepare a sacrifice to their God. Okay? And so the prophets of Baal, they prepared their sacrifice and they got it ready. And then Elijah, he just, he just was there. And the true God would be the one who would answer the prophet with fire from heaven. This was how you would know who the contest winner was. So there was going to be no fakery. There wasn't going to be, you know, any sort of like tie. <laughs> okay. So in Elijah, we see that the challenge was made more difficult. The prophets of Baal, they began to place, prepare their altar. They put a bull on it. And then they called upon their gods to send fire. And they chanted and they danced. And they even cut themselves in all kinds of crazy and desperate ways to attempt to invoke a response from Baal. Hours and hours and hours passed. But there was no fire coming down on the prophet of Baal's altar. So in stark contrast, we see Elijah. And he made the challenge more difficult for himself. He was very certain of who God was. He repaired the altar of the Lord. He placed his offering on it. And he says, just to prove you that I know that my God is true, I'm going to drench my altar in water. I'm going to put more water on it. One wasn't enough. He drenched it several times. Three times altogether. And he wanted to leave that no doubt that the fire would come down. And it was a divine miracle, not a coincidence. 
So then Elijah, he called upon the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and he prayed a concise and powerful prayer acknowledging God's supremacy, requesting that the fire, that the fire be sent down. And then, in an awe-inspiring moment, I love this, fire came down from heaven and consumed not only Elijah's sacrifice, <laughs> but also the altar and the stones and the water, all of it in the trench. And it was a miraculous display of God's power and his unmistakable presence. Let's give God praise for that here this morning. Now, the people had witnessed all of these incredible things and they fell on their face declaring that Elijah's God, he is the one and true God. And it was a turning point and a journey of faith for Israel as they began to try to recognize God's sovereignty over the, the God of Baal. However, something came up. His faith and his courage were about to take a big test. So Elijah, up to this point, had had this great victory over Baal. He was known as being a man of action and a prophet who would declare the truth of God. And because of all of these things, his actions had enraged Queen Jezebel who in the scripture we just read, threatened to take Elijah's very life. It says in verse 2, if you can pull up verse 2. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, May the gods, although it's this lower case, it's not the God, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life, Elijah's life, like that of one of them. It's funny, isn't it? Elijah had went up against King Ahab. He went up against the prophets of Baal. But then when a woman gets involved, I know there's no laughs from the ladies, right? But it's funny, when the woman gets serious, it says in verse 3, he ran for his life. He ran for his life. And when he came to Rashida in Judah, he left his servant there. I wonder why that is. And that's because of this. She wasn't going to mess around. She wasn't going to compromise. She wasn't going to be taken down within a political conversation. She wanted him dead because of what he represented. What did Elijah represent? He represented the true God. And so then he fled and he went and he came to Bersheba in Judah. Now, I want you to know this. This is how far he fled. In, in a, a, I think, a 48-hour period, basically, he had fled almost 100 miles. <laughs> that's fast. That's a, that's a lot when you're running on foot. How many of you can run 100 miles in about two days? Raise your hand. You think you can? Yeah. Oh, you're better than me. Because <laughs> I can but Elijah's journey in the wilderness symbolizes several things. You see, imagine the weight on his shoulders as he faced the threat of death from Jezebel. And he ran into the wilderness feeling alone and exhausted and emotionally drained. And we know that he was so scared he ran 100 miles within a short amount of time. Maybe you can relate to those moments in life where you just wanted to run away from whatever was coming after you. Maybe you're feeling overwhelmed, you're stuck, you're paralyzed by fear and confusion. But as we look at Elijah and his journey in the wilderness, it symbolizes our own struggles. And, and here's the thing, folks. Last time, last week, we talked about being in the valley and having the mountaintop experience. Here was Elijah. You couldn't have a more mountaintop experience than having the prophets of Baal. <laughs> Knowing that you serve the true God by having fire sent down from heaven. Imagine that was your life. How would you feel? You would feel you're kind of like on the mountaintop, right? And then, in a short amount of time, he was running for his life into a wilderness. Verse 4, he says, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness came to a broom bush and he sat down under and he prayed this had enough had enough Lord he said take my life no 
better than my ancestors. Folks, this is a season where I believe many of us may be saying to ourselves, I've had enough. How many of you can just maybe sympathize with that feeling of, man, I, I just feel like I'm worn out. I've had enough. I've had enough. And then he even just said, take my life. Because I'm no better than my ancestors. At some point in life, you may have just simply said that you've had enough. I'm tired of, of dealing with this problem. I, I, I'm just, I'm so done because I've had to, to discipline my kids so many times they just won't listen. I, I quit because I just feel like I'm in this marriage and it's just, it's just hurting and, and I don't know what else to do. And I just, I want out, I want to run, I want to go away. I, I'm tired of being in this position. Many of you just feel like you've just had enough. You see, it's often in the wilderness, in life, that our faith is actually tested the most. And we get pushed past our breaking point at times. And when it happens, we oftentimes let worry and fear, we let the devil, in a way, sometimes just take control. And we begin to make ourselves a bed and sleep in it. Notice here, even in verse 5, it says that Elijah, he says, Then he lay, went and he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. He just lay down in his state of wilderness. And sometimes what happens is we don't ever want to try to get ourselves up. We just want to make ourselves comfortable in the pain or in the situation that we've created for ourselves. But God, amen? See, here's the beauty of it all. Even when Elijah wanted to do away with himself, God knew that he still had purpose. He had a tremendous amount of purpose. And so God provided for Elijah in the wilderness. He sent angels to nourish and strengthen him. In verse 5, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there was by his head some baked bread, hot and the coals and a jar of water he ate and he drank and then he laid down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. He got up, he ate, he drank, and he was strengthened by that food. And then he traveled some more. You'd be tired and hungry too if he ran 100 miles within two days, I guarantee you. But he was strengthened and he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb. The mountain of God. Church, I want you to know this. Whenever you feel tired and depleted, and you're just drained, because it happens to all of us, I want you to know this, that God is there. God is with you. And he wants to be able to offer you rest and replenishment. Notice that God offered him rest. It says he ate, he drank, and then he laid down again. In this season where everything is so crazy and it's busy and there's holidays and there's Christmas parties or there's this and there's that, there's get-togethers, it, it can be very overwhelming. It can be very, sometimes just too much. Sometimes it's just too much because we're dealing with too much in our hands. We've got our health that's not going right. Maybe this job isn't working out for us. Um, this, this situation in life just never resolves itself. We've got this other ball of, of struggle and pain. We've got a loved one that's, that's just, they're not the way they used to be. There's all of these different things that we juggle, we, we struggle with all the time in life. Did you know that I think sometimes the most holiest thing that we can do is rest? God offered rest and replenishment to Elijah. The most holiest thing that sometimes we can do is to let all of those situations lay in the hands of God. I want you to know this, and this is, hopefully you can see it on the screen, is your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. Amen? Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. What's your deepest need today, church? Is your deepest need you're just struggling to make ends meet? 
Maybe you're not feeling loved by your family. Maybe you're just captured in fear and anxiety. You're, you feel broken. You feel like you're just messed up and, and you feel full of shame and guilt and, and like you can't ever have an escape out. Maybe you just feel like you're praying and everything is just bouncing off the walls and you don't feel that God is with you. Or maybe you're just like Elijah and you just want to just quit and just, just die. I know that's bleak. But life can be that way. This is what sometimes when we get into the wilderness, we get lost. We get lost in the pain and the hurt and the emotions. But God is a God, not just first chances, but of second chances and third chances, and fourth and fifth. And, and I can go on and on. And God is here to meet you in your deepest need, just like he did for Elijah. I know you may not like the wilderness that you may find yourself in, but I want you to know this. Your deepest need, your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. What is your deepest need? Ask yourself, what is it that is really bothering me? What is it that I'm really struggling with? What is it that, that really drives me to where I feel miserable? But what is it? Because your deepest need Becomes a gift when you actually use that and it drives you to depend on God. I want you to know this God wants to work in your wilderness. I give him praise for that here. Amen. Now we're going to talk about how he wants to work. God wants to work in your wilderness because God speaks in a whisper. Turn to your neighbor and say, God speaks in a whisper. Amen. We're going to look at the last bit of this piece of scripture here in 1 Kings 19, verses 10 through 12. And 10, it says this. It says, he replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They tore down your altars and they put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. This is Elijah speaking. And then the Lord said this. The Lord said, <laughs> he didn't say there, there. <laughs> there, there. This is what he said. Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Huh. And then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart. Imagine this in your mind. Tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Verse 12. But after the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Why does God whisper? Why does God whisper? We imagine God's voice to be like lightning. And yesterday, we were able to experience some of that. We were <clears throat> taking Ashley out for her birthday. We were in Simpsonville, Kentucky, a little bit outside of Louisville. And in the middle of the day, it kind of felt like this scripture. The rains came and the lightning was just loud and things were just going nuts and you know people in short shorts running for their life no umbrella and just the way it thundered crackled in the air and we took comfort in a little space about this big that was pushed up against the wall it had a little little bit of a hedge over so we weren't getting wet and that just seemed crazy and then I read this piece of scripture. And, and, and God, he used all of these great things. A powerful wind that tore mountains apart. I've never seen that happen, but this is what happened. And then it said rocks were shattered. It's like they're just blowing up like popcorn in the microwave. And then it said this, that the Lord wasn't in any of that. But then he sent an earthquake. Things were shaken up. And then he sent fire. All of these things, 
all of these big, loud things. But, but where was God? It says it wasn't in any of those things. But after all of that came a gentle whisper. You see, in times of stress and anxiety and chaos in our lives, we wonder sometimes why God's voice seems so quiet. Everything else is so loud. But the answer is simple. He whispers. He whispers because he's close. He whispers because he's close. You see, the presence of God is like this. He whispers. When you're far away, you got to get a little louder. Every preacher knows that. <laughs> but when God is close, he doesn't have to scream. He doesn't have to shout, although he can. But he doesn't have to. Because he's close. See, the devil overwhelms us with the noise of life all the time. But all the time, God's closeness ought to be our source of comfort. Because here's what I know. I'm going to put this on the screen. The devil shouts lies and God whispers truth. Amen? Amen. The devil shouts lies. Hey! Look at you, you hypocrite, waking up thinking you can go to church, nothing wrong with you. Look at you. And it's so loud, it's in our, our spirit, isn't it? But God, God whispers, I love you. I'm here for you. I give you grace and mercy. You see, in the wilderness, <clears throat> We often make things to sometimes be that we think that God is so far away. We feel that God is far away when we're in a hospital room and we see someone and you're just standing there at the foot of the bed and, and you know that maybe they don't have long and you sometimes feel like, why, why is this happening? And then, even in the depths of our heart, when, when life is dry and desolate, he wants you to know that he's there. I had the privilege of meeting Debbie Tharp last week. And I've known a lot about Debbie. She's called, we've had a lot of conversations. But because of her health, um, I, I never really was able to see her because she would prefer me not to. And that's okay. That happens sometimes. But I went with Ross and Jeannie and went to go see Debbie Tharp. And she was in her hospital room. And I, I just, I won't forget it because it was, it was very short, but it was very sweet. And she had her phone next to her. And, and she was blasting this song. I think she just wanted all the nurses, everybody in the corridors to hear this. And, and so she was blasting this song, and, and it's the song, The Goodness of God. And you know what that, that song says? 
says this, it says, I love your voice. You've led me through the fire. And in the darkest night, you're close like no other. And I've known you as a father, and I've known you as a friend, and I have lived. Goodness, God. Her deepest need, her deepest need was to find a complete healing for her life. <clears throat> but if you knew her physical situations, you knew how difficult that would be. She had situations with one leg that eventually spread to another leg, and, and the only way to fix it would be able to do a surgery where you had to cut the legs off and amputate, but you couldn't even do that because she was having congestive heart failure at the same time. Well, what are you to do? I don't know about you and your life and situations, but she was worshiping and she didn't care what situation she had going on in her life. And she was blasting that song really loud. And I understand that. Because when the devil shouts lies, God whispers truth. Your deepest need becomes a gift when it drives you to depend on God. So this morning, I want us to depend on him today. I'm going to ask that our musicians and worship team come up this, this morning. And as they're gathering, I just simply want to Going to our closing here today, I want to leave you with this thought. I know being in life in the wilderness where it just seems like we're a little off and lost and we don't know where we're going from one day to the next, oftentimes can be very difficult. But let me tell you this, this is what I've learned in life. And sometimes God has to keep reminding me, but I would rather be in the wilderness with God. I'd rather be in the wilderness with God than be on a mountaintop without him. Amen? Amen? I'd rather be in the wilderness with God than be on a mountaintop without him. And so today, just like Elijah, we all face our different wilderness moments. We all face those moments where we just want to say, I give up, and I, and I just don't know what else to do. And, and, and we just feel so broken in, in, in our relationships. But I want you to remember this, that God is close. His presence is so profound. And so today I want us to be able to embrace your wilderness experience, whatever it is, and increase your dependence on the Lord today. I want to leave you with this passage. It just says in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves the crushed in spirit. I believe that that is true not just because it's in the Word, but because I've seen it and felt it and experienced it in my life. So what I would love for us to do is to do what Debbie did. And we're going to worship one more time. I want us to stand and we're going to sing the goodness of God here this morning. And at this time, if there's anyone that would want to come and pray um, and just feel led with that, Pastor Ross, would you care if you would just lead the individuals if they come to the altar and pray here today? We are going to sing this song and just worship the Lord today. Amen. Let's bow our heads here this morning. Lord, we are enveloped and enwrapped within your goodness here today. And Lord, we may be in a wilderness in our life. And whatever that is, God, you know what that is. So God, I'm asking, Lord, that you you speak to us here today. Help speak to us what our deepest need is to help drive us, Lord, to drive us, Lord, to be within your presence. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you do a transformative work within us here today. Father, may your spirit be felt, and may we share this with those that we love. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, through your Holy Spirit to envelop us and to wrap us and to whisper the words of truth within our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well,
Take a moment, turn to your neighbor and say, God loves you. Amen. And if you're hungry, meet in the gym, and we're going to offer up a prayer here in a moment. And we're going to have some delicious food and fellowship together. Amen. God be with all of you here today. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for listening to our podcast today. If you would like to connect with me or Greencastle Church of the Nazarene, you can find us on Facebook at Greencastle Nazarene and also on our website, www.greencastlenazarene.com. May you have a blessed and wonderful day in the Lord.